And here we come to what I think is the most tragic aspect of this whole debate. Here you have child mortality up to the age of five per thousand persons born, again versus CO2 emissions along the bottom, and here the more the CO2 emissions, the fewer the deaths you get of children before the age of five. Once again, poor old Africa right up there. Look at that, Sierra Leone, 285 people per thousand dying if their children are under five, compared with 7.7 per thousand in Iceland. And CO2, the correlation there, again, you might say it doesn't imply causation, but there are reasons why it should. And if, therefore, you say to the third world, no, you can't have the carbon emissions we've already had that have made us prosperous, that have reduced our mortality rates, then you are condemning them to die in their tens of millions. And I do not think that is something which this House ought to find acceptable. Let's move along and, and see the problem in a different light. Here, the world population is... Um, growing very rapidly, not particularly rapidly, in the prosperous countries because, and this is the paradox of population, it's the level of prosperity which determines your rate of increase in population. The more prosperous you are, paradoxically, the less fast you will reproduce. There are many economic, social and medical reasons why this should be so. If we say to third world countries, you are going to have to deny yourselves carbon emissions, the likely effect of that, demographically speaking, is going to be that they will increase their population, or at the very least fail to reduce it towards stability, which they would be able to do if they were allowed the prosperity, which is very closely correlated with fossil fuel consumption. We could be advocating policies that will actually increase not only the poverty in these countries, but the environmental disaster that poverty produces of overpopulation and hence depletion of resources and incredible damage to the environment and of course if there are lots more people however where you stack it there's going to be a larger carbon footprint whether you like it or not. Well now there are two other considerations we need to look at, one other major one and that is shouldn't we take precautions <coughs> just in case the scientists are right that are trying to push this alarmist notion. The murderous I've called it precautionary principle, it's not a principle at all, it's an expedient used by in the environmentalist lobby to justify schemes which, without a slogan of that kind, would be seen for what they are, which is barking mad and incredibly cruel. Now, I'm going to look at two previous worldwide scares, both of them quite recent. One was a real scare, one was a bogus scare. Both of them, the policies were got disastrously wrong because of the effect of pressure groups and the result was that in each case, millions died. Here we go. HIV. Now, 20 years ago, I had just come out of number 10. I went across to the US Army Medical Research Division, who had done the first detailed researches on AIDS. I said, my cabinet needs to know what this is going to do and what we should do about it. And the guy in charge of the research almost in tears, said, oh my God, how nice that somebody is asking rather than telling me. He said, I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to make sure that we test everyone to find out who's got it, and we isolate, in the kindliest way possible, those who have got it. That is the standard procedure with any fatal infectious transmissible disease. That's what you do. And I said, well, you know, that's rather difficult, isn't it, socially? We've got campaigning groups saying we mustn't do that. He said, yes, we have. But if they prevail, tens, perhaps hundreds of millions will die. And he said, I beg of you, use your voice, go and write and say we must do this, because it will help us internally to argue this case, which we're not winning at the moment. So I wrote, first in the US and then in the UK. I was subjected as a result of those articles to some of the most intense personal vituperation and vilification that I've ever received in a long and sometimes controversial career. I was the subject of hate mail, phone calls, threats, death threats, the lot. Because I suggested that people who got AIDS ought to be isolated so that people who hadn't got it wouldn't get it. This was regarded as totally unacceptable and cruel and vicious and etc. And it was heartbreaking, and I mean heartbreaking, what then happened. <laughs> Let's move on. Since I wrote those articles and I failed, I failed to persuade people to do the right thing, 25 million people died worldwide, 40 million now are infected, 7.5% infected south of the Sahara, 0.7% infected in the United States, and now 
a warning to the United States and eventually to us, 1% is the epidemic threshold. Once 1% prevalence is achieved in the United States, nobody's talking about this over there. Then you can't stop it spreading right through the population as it has in Africa. That's what happens. It'll be a bit slower than in Africa for various factors, but it will still spread. It will kill millions, even in the countries of the West, because we did not have the courage to face down the narrow vested interests of those who did not realise the harm they were doing because we know from epidemiology that taking, if you isolate cases, you don't get deaths like this. Let's move on from this horrible story. These are the larvae of the Anopheles mosquito. And there are three interesting little letters which are entirely absent from the IPCC's ramblings about malaria in its latest report. And those letters are DDT. Before the DDT ban, which was brought in as a result of environmentalist pressure, there were 50,000 deaths per year from malaria. After the DDT ban, one million deaths per year from malaria. It's still about 850,000 now. Total excess deaths, depending on which scientific paper you read, between 30 and 50 million people died and are still dying because of that crazy decision by first the United States of all countries to ban DDT. The DDT ban was lifted on the 15th of September 2006. Finally, the world's bureaucracy that governs this, the World Health Organization, decided that enough was enough. And Dr. Arata Kochi said the following. He said, quite often in this field, politics comes first and science second. We must take a position based on the science and the data. And that, in essence, is the position that I'm inviting you in this house to take tonight. There are moral issues, clearly moral issues, that are raised by this debate. And I want to look at those moral issues now. I want to sum up what I've said to you. Now, Al Gore says, as you can see on that slide, I believe this is a moral issue. And so it is a moral issue. To announce disasters or scary scenarios, to over-represent factual presentations in place of adherence to the strict scientific objective truth, that is a moral issue. To allow politicians to insert false data into official scientific documents, to alter those documents so as to contradict or overstate scientific conclusions, to manipulate decimal points so as to engender false headlines by exaggerating tenfold, those are moral issues. To claim scientific unanimity where none exists, to assert that catastrophe is likely when most scientists do not, to exalt theoretical computer models which cannot in any event work over real-world observations, to misstate the conclusions of scientific papers or the meaning of observed data, to overstate the likely future course of climatic phenomena by several orders of magnitude, those are moral issues to reverse the sequence of events in the early climate, to persist in false denial that past temperatures exceeded today's, to state that climate events that have not occurred have occurred, to ascribe these non-events as well as specific extreme weather events unjustifiably to humankind, those are moral issues. And above all, to inflict upon the nations of the world a policy of ever grimmer energy starvation, calculated not merely to inconvenience the prosperous, but to condemn the very poorest to remain in poverty forever and to die unheeded in their tens of millions for want of the light and heat and power and medical attention which we have long been fortunate enough to take for granted. That is a moral issue. So this house is the house of youth. Here, high ideals are shaped and sharpened. Here, of all places, it is surely understood that in each of us, however far, how far apart, in mere distance or origin or wealth or achievement, there is the spark of the divine, the image and likeness of our creator. That by this communion with our maker, each of us, however poor, is of unique and precious value, that therefore there is only one race 
the human race, that the suffering children of Africa, of Asia and South America, imploring us with their hopeless, hopeful eyes, are our people. We must get the science right or we shall get the policy wrong. We have failed them and failed them before. We must not fail them again.